It's not you, the thumbnail. Hello, everyone, and uh, warm welcome to today's edition of Pathcast. And today is September 26, Tuesday, 2023. I'm Rifat Mannan in California, and I am remotely joined by my good friend, Emilia Madrigal. So today we are very delighted to welcome back Dr. Ramil Saxena, who needs no introduction actually. And she's a very renowned liver pathologist and she's now professor of pathology at Emory University School of Medicine. And we are really very delighted to have her with us today. And today she is going to have a session on liver pathology, which she names it as Liver Tuesdays, because we hope that we will have more sessions in the future. And uh, her plan is to share some live cases and using a virtual microscope, as you will see soon. And I want to also mention that you guys all know that this is her very popular liver pathology book. This is Practical Hepatic Pathology. So this is an awesome book. And those of you who might not have uh, known about it, so please uh, consider this is an amazing book and thanks to Dr. Saxena. And I also want to mention that today's session is in collaboration with Association of Indian Pathologists of North America. And I want to thank the office bearers for making this session happen. And as always to our viewers, so please feel free to post your questions and comments on YouTube and Facebook chat windows, and we will pass them over to Dr. Saxena. And over to you now, Dr. Saxena, and thanks so much. Thank you, um, Rifat, for the very, very kind introduction. And thank you, Pathcast, for having me back. I also want to thank and acknowledge Aitna for making this possible. We are doing this under the aegis of Aitna, which is the Association of Indian Pathologists in North America. And um, as Rifat said, uh, we are hoping to make this a regular feature on Pathcast. And the idea here was to share some of the cases that I have come across recently. So it's just routine practice. I wanted to share some of the cases that I've seen in routine practice. And uh, also, to it's not necessarily uh, heavy duty teaching, but it will be more about looking at these cases together and enjoying a little bit of liver pathology. So with that, I will start sharing the screen. Um, just need a minute to set up. Okay. Right. Yeah. So these are going to be Liver Tuesdays mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, these things happen on Tuesdays. Pathcast does all their uh, uh, lectures and sessions on Tuesdays. And we will look at whole slide images with a virtual microscope. And I'm sharing some cases which I have come across over the last month and sort of collected them and put them together because either they were interest, well, they were all interesting, but uh, uh, you know, some of them were just fun cases. So the first one is a case that came in consultation. It Dr. Was... Saxena, sorry to interrupt. Can you turn off your video if you don't oh, mind? Yes. Sorry, I'm sorry. I no, it's all right. That. Sorry. Uh, let me just do that. Okay, one sec. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Please yeah. go ahead. No problem. Thank you. So the first case was a case that came in consultation, and it was a 39-year-old female who was undergoing polycystectomy. And the surgeon noticed a two centimeter popcorn shaped lesion on the surface of the liver. The liver was otherwise grossly unremarkable. And in the consultation letter that uh, we received, the note said that the histology resembles cirrhosis. However, as the lesion is described as focal and subcapsular, the diagnosis is a little pro problematic. They had performed already a CK7 and a copper. So let's look at this case. 
And here is the H&E section. You can see that this is a wedge, multiple pieces. Uh, the wedge had been serially sectioned and submitted for processing. And if we look at this, you see that there are these fibrous septa that have this curvilinear appearance. And the eagle-eyed among you might have even noticed this, but I will come back to that later. What we essentially have are these curvilinear septa, which is what gave the impression of cirrhosis to the uh, pathologist who was sending us the case. And if you look at these septa, there are bile ductules that are proliferating at the edges of the septa. Um, just give me one second. I have a phone call that I'm sorry I have to take care of. One, just give me one second. Okay, I'm back. I'm sorry about that. Uh, there was a phone call from the lab. So anyway, so we have these septa where there are these proliferating bile ductules or a ductular reaction, if if you uh, if you prefer, and it gives a cirrhotic nodular appearance to this lesion. So it does look cirrhotic, but we also know that it is a focal lesion that it is on sitting on the surface of the liver. And then we begin to notice these uh, structures, which are basically vascular structures, but they are abnormal. They are thickened and sort of eccentrically thickened in that it's not uniform. And so for those of us who may have encountered or have definitely encountered the situation of the past, we immediately think of a focal nodular hyperplasia. Here is another vessel which is eccentrically thickened. So this is the vessel and on one side of it, the wall is very thickened. The other side looks uh, pretty uh, thin. So eccentrically thickened blood vessels in these fibrous septa, we think of a focal nodular hyperplasia. Now, just to uh, admire the ductular reaction that was uh, seen in the h and &E, and because the uh, referring pathologist had done a CK7, we get to see this ductular reaction and you see how there is an extensive positivity for CK7 in these slides. And you see the little ductules, you also see biliary metaplasia of hepatocytes within the, within the tumor itself or the lesion itself. And it is really, really florid. But this is not a stain that you would necessarily need for diagnosis. The one stain that helps us to clinch the diagnosis if we want a brown confirmation is a glutamine synthetase. And here is a typical, typical um, example of uh, glutamine uh, synthetase of what it would look like in focal nodular hyperplasia. It has been described by the French as a map-like pattern. And what it really means is that there is irregular geographic pattern of staining. And you see that very, very well in this stain. So this is the one stain that we would have to do to clinch the diagnosis of focal nodular hyperplasia. And um, so this is what uh, we called it. We called it a focal nodular hyperplasia. It made perfect sense clinically um, because it was an isolated lesion. The liver was normal. It was a young woman. So focal nodular hyperplasia is the first case and the first diagnosis. So case number one, focal nodular hyperplasia. 
the salient features, just to go over those, it's always a focal lesion. In other words, if you are thinking of cirrhosis, but uh, the surgeon or the radiographer has said that this is a focal lesion, the next thing that should come to mind is focal nodular hyperplasia. H&E clinching featured on an H&E is the presence of abnormal vessels which are eccentrically thickened. If you want to do a brown stain to confirm it or just because you want to admire the pattern, the one to two is glutamine synthetase, which shows an irregular geographic map-like pattern of staining. The French love to call it a map-like pattern and what they really mean is this irregular geographic pattern of staining. So with that, I can move on to case two. Case two was a 84 year old female with multiple liver masses. And I tried to dig into the history to see how those liver masses came to attention, came to clinical attention. She was an older lady, she was not having any symptoms, but it turned out that she had a uh, she had uh, elevated alkaline phosphatase and anemia. And I think they were going, they were chasing after the alkphos. And therefore they did some imaging and they found these multiple liver masses. Now, digging into her history, she had some chronic liver disease, uh, lung disease. She had COPD, she had hyperlipidemia, and she had a host of other things which are not quite relevant to what we will be looking at today. Uh, she had never smoked, she did not consume alcohol, and there was no history of illicit drugs. So let's uh, look at the slide, the biopsy. So this is the biopsy. There are multiple fragmented uh, pieces of liver. And what you immediately see is this tumor, which has a very papillary appearance. And I'll just move around so that you get a feel for this. There is this, these very well-defined papilla going throughout. And once we start looking at the cells, there is this sort of hobnailed appearance, angry looking, uh, hyperchromatic nuclei, um, and some more of that. Again, the hobnailing, the very high, the hyperchromasia, the um, pleomorphism. In other words, it is an ugly tumor. And she was an 84 year old uh, woman. So some of the thoughts that come, came to our head was, uh, and, uh, was um, GYN tumors, for example, maybe a kidney tumor, uh, a lung tumor. Those were our three main considerations when we looked at this uh, case. And so I ordered a CK7, a CK19, a PAX8, WT1, GATA3, and TTF1, and Napsin. And basically, I was trying to rule out GU, uh, genital urinary, uh, gynecological, and lung uh, tumor. And the stains that came back showed us this. So this is the double stain for Napsin and um, TTF1. The brown stain in the nuclei, as you might have guessed, is the TTF1 because TTF1 is a nuclear uh, antigen, whereas the Napsin1 is a cytoplasmic antigen, and that is the red chromogen marking the cytoplasmic antigen. And I'm showing this case uh, not necessarily because it is difficult. I think that anyone practicing pathology would have, uh, you know, proceeded along the same pathway. Although there might have been, there might be things that you're probably thinking, oh, she missed this. 
But the reason I'm showing this is because I just want to admire the absolutely beautiful staining that has come out here. Besides the beautiful morphology, unfortunate for the patient, but uh, I'm a visual animal. And if I see a beautiful picture, I, you know, I sit and enjoy it. And I wanted to share that with the audience. So here we have this absolutely beautiful, beautiful stain that marks every single tumor cell, both with the TTF1 and the Napsin1. And so we were able to say that this was a lung um, adenocarcinoma. And uh, the um, other stains... CK7 was positive, CK19 was positive. The ones for the genitourinary and the, um, the GYN tract were negative. So we had negative PAX8, negative WT1, and GATA3. And so we were able to call it a metastatic lung adenocarcinoma. Of course, from then on, uh, the tissue was sent for molecular testing, you know, the various targetable uh, mutations or um, molecular signatures. Um, I do not have much follow-up on this patient because she went off to a specialized cancer institute, maybe something like uh, where Rifat or Dr. Manan works at, because we have a City of Hope uh, satellite actually in Atlanta, and she probably went off there. So I do not have more information. I do not even know where she put, whether she pursued treatment because she was 84 years old and maybe she decided not to go through it. But that was an interesting case and a very good uh, example of how immunohistochemistry, when it works, can really help us. So with that, I will move on to case number three. So case number three is a 66-year-old female who had hysteroscopic uh, dilatation and curettage. And in that, there was found a four millimeter, so really tiny, focus of non-invasive serous endometrial carcinoma in a background of benign polyps. So she then underwent uh, extensive surgery. She had a total hysterectomy, bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy, bilateral sentinel node biopsies, and omental biopsies. And no residual carcinoma was found in, uh, in the surgical uh, specimens and the endometrium was called disordered proliferative endometrium, but no residual carcinoma. Now, a few months later, she was asked to come for follow-up. And in the follow-up, a CT scan was done and a three centimeter sized liver mass was found. A PET CT did not show metabolic activity. So it seemed to be sort of quiet. But this case is, uh, uh, but, but uh, the, the surgeon uh, wondered if this was metastatic disease. And uh, this case is sort of um, stuck in my memory because I happened not to be in my office and I received this text and a phone call and uh, paging, page uh, about this case. Um, I called the surgeon back. And she told me that uh, she was panicking. She said that this is extremely important. We need to know if there is metastatic disease in the liver, because depending on what you tell us, we will be able to do this, that, and the other. Um, you know, we will cancel surgery uh, that we have planned if this is uh, a tumor. And if this is not a tumor, we will proceed with what we want to do. And it seems to be that they weren't really doing much, but she really wanted to know what was going on. And I happened to be outside my office. So, um, so I, I, you know, I was feeling a little bit uh, like, oh my God, I'm not giving them a timely diagnosis. An email was sent out to, to the GYN pathologist. So everybody was in the loop on this case. And the GYN pathologist, my colleagues were a little bit, uh, uh, apologetic about this whole situation, saying, oh, they just did the biopsy. They should not be expecting the diagnosis so soon since it was just done last evening. Um, so, you know, there was all this drama going on. And my main concern was that 
if this is a tumor in the liver, I hope I can make a diagnosis because I'm not the best with GYN tumors. So uh, with that background, I come in the office, so, you know, rushing into the office from wherever it was that I was in a meeting or something, and I look at the case. And this is... Um, the biopsy. So it's highly fragmented, very thin cores. That's the first thing that makes you hold your breath because you're like, I hope we can make a diagnosis. These are not the best cores on earth. And then I look at it and I heave a big sigh of relief because A, I can make the diagnosis and B, it's extremely good for the patient because this is, as you would have all recognized, a cavernous hemangioma. So here's the liver, looks pristine, looks very happy, nothing much going on. Here's a tiny bile duct, a normal portal tract, and then this is the lesion. And the lesion consists of these vascular spaces. We can see the red blood cells over here, and you have uh, flattened cells, which are endothelial cells. And so here is a cavernous hemangioma in all its glory. So here you see a nice flattened uh, lining to these spaces. They contain red blood cells, so cavernous hemangioma. The patient is safe and sound. The surgeon was very happy. And uh, this is our diagnosis of a cavernous hemangioma. So cavernous hemangioma is the commonest benign lesion in the liver. And uh, the data comes mostly from older autopsy studies where they were looking at uh, tumors in the liver and they found that a lot of people have cavernous hemangiomas. They go through life with this lesion, nothing really happens. It's only when um, nowadays we see a lot of them because of the lot of uh, imaging that goes on, uh, um, you know, the, the tumors, because of tumors, and as in this case, there might be a, um, an alarm for metastatic disease. So, so we do see them on biopsies quite uh, not infrequently in current practice, and that's because of follow-up for tumors. But uh, in the past, they were mostly discovered at autopsy, and uh, they obviously do no harm to the patient. Now, there are other lesions in the liver that are in the realm of hemangiomas or benign slash borderline uh, liver uh, vascular lesions. And these are not things that I want to discuss now, maybe at a future session, but I just wanted to throw out the names so that you're all familiar with it. And uh, besides the cavernous hemangioma, the capillary hemangioma has been described and anastomosing hemangioma has been described. Both of these in comparison are extremely rare in comparison with the cavernous hemangioma. So you may see them or you may never go, never see them go, you know, going through your practice. And then there is the hepatic small vessel neoplasm. And this is a name given to a lesion that uh, sits on the borderline, it's a, it's, it's a lesion that sort of worries you because there's a little bit of atopia, it seems to be invading into the adjacent liver, but it clearly doesn't look very nasty and you're really not sure what this is going to do in the future. And uh, these are the lesions that have been termed small uh, hepatic small vessel neoplasm. And of course they are small vessels by the way, so you don't get these big uh, cavernous type of uh, vascular structures. Uh, but to date, none of them have metastasized or recurred. But it is something. It is a useful uh, um, name for a lesion that worries you and that you cannot easily sign off as a benign lesion. So with that, I will go to case number four. This was a 56-year-old patient with liver lesions. And I will show you the biopsy now. And here it is. 
So this is the h &E of one of those lesions. And the first thing that you see on this is that the architecture is obviously effaced. You do not see normal liver. And at the same time, you are seeing bile ducts that are recurring at, at, at frequent intervals, or which means that there are portal structures. So um, coming at regular intervals, but at the same time, what's happening in between is uh, abnormal. You can see, of course, uh, normal hepatocytes, or at least uh, you can see hepatocytes within the lesion. So it's not complete uh, total annihilation of the liver elements, but these hepatocytes look like they have been squ squashed. They have been sort of strangled by something else. And there is something going on in the sinusoids, which is what is strangling these hepatocytes. Most of this is fibrous tissue. So you can see the fibrous tissue here. And then as I move along, I can show you a portal tract. There are the bile ducts. There are some more squashed something. These are hepatocytes. And as we keep moving along, you begin to see how here there is even more fibrosis. You have the squashed hepatocytes. But there are also some cells that make one very uncomfortable because they are these hyperchromatic nuclei. And then, of course, there is some fat that is also entrapped within all this, whatever it is that's going on. So I'll just keep moving so you get a flavor of this. And um, again, squashed hepatocytes, sinusoids that are chock-a-block with uh, fibrous tissue. And then what exactly is that cell? Is it a squashed hepatocyte, but it has a very hypochromatic nucleus? Um, there is something here. There's like a little vascular structure. Now, I can go on with that. Um, you know, this is basically what we are seeing. You are seeing these hyperchromatic cells. You're seeing, I don't know, is this a blood vessel that is obliterated like a central vein? We don't know. Uh, but one thing that when I see something like this, where there is a lot of fibrous tissue that's going through the sinusoids, you're not seeing very clear cut uh, malignant cells, but there are cells that make you uncomfortable. The one thing that does come to my mind is uh, epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. And that's what I thought of in this biopsy. I had, did not have a history initially. I just had liver lesions. And um, this is the biopsy that I had. And I was seeing that there was some effacement of the architecture, but not a total replacement of the hepatic architecture. I was seeing that there were hepatocytes that were squashed. I was seeing a lot of fibrosis. And here, for example, there's a lot of fibrosis. So the first thought that came to my mind was uh, uh, um, epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. And so, and so I set out to, uh, you know, to prove that, uh, because if you can prove that, then you're done. Uh, you know, you made the diagnosis. And I did a special stain, but before I go on to that, I want to just point out some things here. For example, here, there are two very ugly nuclei with something pink in between. There is another one here that uh, you have like a signet ring cell. So you have a hyperchromatic nucleus and a vacuole that contains a red blood cell. And then you have another one over here. So when we, I started looking, I saw a few of those, not too many. Uh, and then you also have something like this. It's not exactly a signet ring cell, but it's a tiny little blood vessel that is trying to form uh, itself. It's another signet ring cell. So these signet ring cells are pretty characteristic of epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. And the difference from a signet ring adenocarcinoma is that these contain red blood cells as opposed to mucin droplets. And the stain that one would do for this is a marker for um, endothelial cells. And so I did a CD31. Which is this stain here. 
And what I've noticed uh, in all these cases of epithelial hemangioendotheliomas, that when you do a stain for the endothelial marker, you always see more cells than you were able to appreciate on the HNE. And that's what we're seeing here. So for example, you have these very big, ugly nuclei um, that are marking for the CD31. And these are all malignant cells. And although I saw malignant cells or, you know, very suspicious looking cells on the h &E, I don't think I saw this much. So the, the, the stain will always mark out more cells than you are, are prepared to see almost. There is another one over here. It's forming a sort of a vascular structure or a structure out here. Look at that one. And then, of course, we have our single cells that we have seen earlier. Now, amongst all this, there will also be some, you know, uh, pre-existing sinusoids, but that's not what we are focusing on. We are focusing on malignant cells that are marking for CD31. And here is a portal tract, and you see how it's going all around it. Uh, this is the normal small arteriole of the portal tract. Here's the bile duct. This is the arteriole. And the CD31 is marking the surface of those endothelial cells. But the rest of these here are all malignant. So this is a very good example of an epithelioid hemangioendothelioma in the liver a very distinctive lesion, which is marked by a whole lot of fibrosis. So if you see a whole lot of fibrosis, it is one of the things that was almost come, almost always come to mind. And then once you've thought of it, you will be, you will start looking for the signet ring cells or the abnormal cells. So um, then I looked into the history of this patient and it's actually very interesting. So she was diagnosed with or was found to have lung and liver lesions in 2012. So this is more than 10 years ago. And uh, histologic diagnosis came back as hemangioendothelioma. Um, this was on a liver lesion that had been biopsied. And what they did next was they did the radiofrequency and Y90 ablation of some of these lesions in the liver. And there was no progression of the lung lesions, which was sub-centimeter, so they were relatively small. And they kept following her. And then in 2023, this year, there were new lesions that were discovered. One of those lesions is the one that I just showed you. It was biopsied, uh, and I showed you it was an epithelial hemangioendothelioma. They went ahead and did microwave ablation this time. And what was interesting to me is, as I read the notes, the, the oncologist has, has made this comment that Mrs. So-and-so has indolent disease, which is amenable to ablation. And in a note to her, she, he says, uh, so they did a follow-up um, MRI after they had ablated. And they said that there is a hole where the tumor got ablated. And this hole will fill in with liver as it heals. And you know, talk, let's talk about uh, regeneration of the liver, but that will be for another day. And then he says that there are no newcomers. So um, this is a, a, a nice, nice little note to the patient and a nice little um, history that tells you the general um, uh, natural history of hemangioendotheliomas, at least the ones that behave well. Most of them tend to be indolent disease. They can go on forever and ever and ever and ever. And now with all the ablation techniques that uh, we have at our disposal, the disposal, they can be ablated as they, uh, you know, as they raise their heads. Um, I have how there are those that don't behave as well as well uh, as well, and I've seen those. There are those that grow to enormous sizes before they come to light. There are those that cannot be ablated or uh, because they're simply so large. And um, some of these have had liver liver patients have had liver transplantations for epithelial hemangioendothelioma. I've seen a couple of cases of those, and. The, the tumor does tend to come back in the liver. And once again, it may be, it can be ablated and, you know, the patient can live for a long time. And some of them though, when they come back can be more aggressive and uh, there are reports and I have seen at least one case 
where the recurrent was very aggressive and more like an angiosarcoma rather than like an epithelial demandio endothelioma. So there is a whole um, spectrum to these. Most of them are well behaved, but some of them might not be. So that's our case number four. It is an epithelioid hemangioendothelioma. Now case number five was a 52-year-old female who had abnormal LFT since 2017. And these are primary cholestatic. Um, alkaline phosphatase was raised. So I'll show you the biopsy. And here it is. And, at, and these are nice scores, actually. It's slightly fragmented, but very nice scores. And on this very low scanning power, you see that there is patchy chronic, uh, well, I don't know if it's chronic, but patchy inflammation in the portal tracts. So there have to be more than what we're seeing, but uh, the inflammation seems to have affected only a few of these. And so if I zoom in on these, and I go from one end to the other, what we see here is a portal tract where the bile duct doesn't look terribly happy. And there's something here too. And this has, seems to have a very thick basement membrane. And then there is a mild inflammation and I suspect a little bit of a ductular reaction as well, meaning that there are proliferating bile ductules as well as inflammatory cells. And then these damaged bile ducts with a thick basement membrane. The next one is very similar. Here is a bile duct that looks like it's under the weather. Um, the nuclei are not uniform. There is some nuclear overlapping. The basement membrane is thickened. And again, there is something going on in the sport tract, which is a combination of proliferating bile ductules as well as inflammation. The next portal tract, look at this bile duct, it's left to like three measly nuclei. So it's really attenuated uh, as well as this one. Uh, there are cells here that are disappearing. And if we did a CK7 stain on this, some uh, this would show a little uh, bit of ductular reaction as well as inflammation. So there's ductular reaction, inflammation, and very uh, sad looking bile ducts. Same story with this, uh, portal tract, here's your bile duct that's damaged. And the other thing as we go through is that there is a little bit of fat and I'm pointing that out because when you see the history, I'll tell you, you, you you'll realize why I'm pointing that out. And then here is, uh, is the sort of the star bile duct, the one that actually almost gives the diagnosis away. So here's a bile duct, which is infiltrated by cells. And these are neutrophils as well as lymphocytes. And then you have this lymphoid aggregate, which seems to be attacking specifically the bile duct. It's not really interested in the hepatocytes outside. It's, it's centered on the bile ducts. That's the one that's interested in. And you notice a few EOs as well in this uh, portal tract. So this is what I would call lymphocytic cholangitis meaning, uh, well, as the name explains, self-explanatory, there is cholangitis and it's because of the lymphocytes. So there in this portal tract, we have lymphocytic cholangitis, we have a few plasma cells, we have some uh, um, eosinophils, there is no interface hepatitis and it's the bile duct that's a target of attack. And then you keep moving and I see some steatosis, okay? Same, uh, the theme is the same now. Uh, we have uh, small portal tracts, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, nothing really specific. There's uh, a little bit of ductular reaction in this one and we keep moving. Here's a portal tract with a large hepatic arteriole and a, a bile duct that looks like it's not doing very well.
Here we have a very nice image actually, because you have an arterial and a bile duct sitting next to each other as they're supposed to do. Um, the bile duct is not terribly damaged, but slightly damaged, but, uh, but, uh, but this, is, uh, not, this wouldn't have given us any diagnosis because it doesn't show too many features. And here, once again, we have an inflamed portal tract you can see the artery. This is the bile duct here that looks extremely damaged. So you have cells, cholangiocytes here that uh, with cytoplasmic uh, vacuolation, and so they are on their deathbed basically. Um, and let me see what else I want to show you. Oh, I'm going too fast for this, I guess. Um, Some more damaged bile ducts. You see that there's a little apoptotic body. You see there's another apoptotic body in this bile duct. So they're getting damaged. You see some eosinophils. You see no interface hepatitis. And here we have uh, another portal tract with a bile duct. There is no lymphocytic cholangitis in the sense that there are no lymphocytes within it. It doesn't look terribly damaged. But you see how the lymphocytic infiltrate is centered around the bile duct. So anyway, so this is what the biopsy showed. And the diagnosis for something like this, where you have lymphocytic cholangitis, it is uh, patchy. So not all portal tracts show that. It's very patchy. The remaining portal tracts show bile duct damage but there is no interface hepatitis and there's some primary, uh, there's some ductular reaction. The first thought that comes to my mind is primary biliary cholangitis. And I already have um, a history of elevated alkaline phosphatase. So then I look into the history and First of all, it says that there is NAFLD and that, uh, um, and I don't know how they got to that um, because I didn't see a whole lot else in the history, but she does have Sjogren's syndrome. There is a very strong association of Sjogren's and primary biliary cholangitis. She also has Hashimoto's, so she does have other types of autoimmune disorders. And then when I look at the immunology, her AMA is positive. M2 antibody is positive. It's uh, in the path pathogenic uh, range. The F actin is positive and the ANA is one in 160. Now, very often when, when we have these cases of PBC and the ANA is raised, there is also a question of, is there overlap syndrome? Uh, is there also an associated autoimmune hepatitis? And as I showed in this case, there was no interface hepatitis. So, th so this was not overlap. A lot of patients with uh, PVC will have positive ANA, but besides that, she had other, uh, you know, uh, autoimmune disorders. So that ANA positivity in a case with PVC does not always mean interface hepatitis or uh, autoimmune hepatitis. And this is important because you do not want the patient to get steroids. These patients, patients with PBC already have a lot of uh, osteoporosis and giving them steroids would only worsen that situation. So we don't want to do it. So we have to be very careful about not calling, over calling overlap uh, disease uh, in patients with PBC. So this was a case of primary biliary cholangitis. And the take home message here on the biopsy would be that you do not always see granulomatous cholangitis and you can still make a diagnosis of primary biliary cholangitis without the granulomatous destruction of the bile duct. The second point is that these lesions tend to be very patchy. So sometimes you might not even have a lesion in the biopsy, but you might have other things. You might have ductular reaction, you might have copper deposition, you might just have damage to bile ducts, loss to bile ducts. And you know, those things, would support a diagnosis of primary biliary cholangitis. So then moving on to my last case, which was a 55-year-old female, and she had a mass in the liver. And the imaging said that this was a fatty tumor. 
So the surgeon went in and removed this thing and we got the resection specimen. which is here. So first of all, so it was um, a small resection. And first of all, I just want to show the normal liver or the uninvolved liver because it's a beautiful sight to behold. It's, uh, you know, there is some inflammation, the very minimal ductular reaction. I consider these to be nonspecific findings in this particular case, because there is a mass occupying lesion next door, but there is otherwise no steatosis or fibrosis or anything of that kind. So here is a very nice example of, uh, of what a normal liver should look like. You see some nice lipofusion pigment, which is around the central veins of the terminal hepatic uh, venules. Uh, this is a nice portal tract with the hepatic arteriole, the bile duct, and the portal vein. There is a little bit of a ductule out there. So just normal liver cruising along, or near normal liver, I would say, without much going on. And then we go to the lesion. And this is the lesion. So it is uh, short enough fatty, uh, as the imaging uh, had uh, demonstrated. So it's a very fatty lesion. And then in between, it has other cells that look slightly epithelioid. And it also has, uh, you know, um, like eosinophils. And I also want to show you that there was Yes, like extra medullary hemopoiesis out here. So there's a lot of extra medullary hemopoiesis in this lesion. And when um, there are some thin walled vessels, but really nothing much to write home about. There are, there is here this structure, but it's, uh, there are large vessels, but then there are also bile ducts. So I suspect that there is a portal tract over here. But once again, if we look within this area, you see a lot of extra medullary hemopoieses. And then you see some of these cells that look a little bit um, uh, epithelioid with a feathery type of cytoplasm, fibrillar cytoplasm, I should, pro uh, I should probably say, a fibrillar cytoplasm. Uh, these are normal hepatocytes that seem to be trapped or uh, within the lesion or they are at the edge of the lesion. And uh, here is another cell that it has this sort of spidery cytoplasm, like a spider's web maybe. So, so what we see is a very fatty lesion with cells in between, some of which have this spidery cytoplasm. There's another one over here and a lot of extramedullary hemopoieses, not too many vessels. But the thought that comes to mind is an angiomyolipoma. Now, the other thought that came to mind was also a, a myelolipoma, which is a lipoma with lots of extra medullary hemopoieses. And so, of course, the stain that you would do would be uh, HMB45. And you see how nicely it lights up the lesion. So here we have those cells that were in between that looked a little bit fibrillary that um, had this sort of spider web, but some of them had this, they all light up with the HMB45. And that is the diagnostic stain for angiomyolipoma. So this was a nice case of angiomyolipoma. And to be perfectly honest, uh, the surgeon had already given the clue. So he said in his, uh, you know, they, they usually write very little, but in this one, he was so confident that he actually said resection of angiomyolipoma. And so I already knew going in what I was looking for. And uh, the HMB45 uh, confirmed the diagnosis. So this is an angiomyolipoma. And 
That's the diagnosis. And it usually, uh, not usually, but it should consist of a trio of fat, adipose tissue, vessels, large blood vessels, and these myoid cells, which are positive for HMB45. Angiomyolipomas are not uncommon in the liver. You will see them from time to time, sometimes in biopsies, sometimes as dissection specimens. And they do not have much of a clinical connotation in that they're not necessarily associated with a syndrome or anything like that. They're usually solitary, resection is curative. And um, the, the, the difference, the, the, the reason this one was a little bit unusual is that most angiomyolipomas in the liver tend to be epithelioid. They have a lot of those myoid cells. And this one was had a lot of fat and very few myoid cells. So that was what was a little bit unusual about this lesion. But nonetheless, it was an interesting and a nice looking angiomyolipoma. And with that, I thank you for your attention. If this thing would only move. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the next slide is just a thank you slide. So yeah, I'm done. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Saxena. Thanks a lot. Uh, you might like to stop sharing. Yeah, this is this. Yeah, we can see the screen. And uh, let me stop sharing. Yes. Yeah, you can please and then start put on the your... video. Okay. Yeah, now we can see you. So now, thank you, Dr. Saxena, for this uh, educative session with so many very challenging and interesting cases. There are quite a few questions from our viewers. So let me read them one by one. The first question is, uh, if we have multiple nodes, say 20 to 30, and we see FNH on the biopsy, do you recommend to perform additional biopsies to exclude other differentials? If you have multiple, what was the first line you said? If you have multiple nodules, uh, like 20 to 30 nodules on the liver, and uh, you see FNH on the liver biopsy. No, okay. You suggest other additional biopsies to exclude other differentials. That's the question. right. So the association of uh, focal nodular hyperplasia uh, plasia with uh, adenomas is well known. Uh, there have been many reports of that. So I I don't make strong recommendations like I to the clinicians. Um, I just let them know that there is an association, and you might want to do some more. Um, biopsies. And I just know that at least in uh, North America, because it is the, the type of society that it is, if there are 20 to 30 nodes, uh, be sure that you will get more than one, uh, not nodes, but nodules, be sure that you will get more than one biopsy because the clinician is more anxious than we can ever be. Right. Uh, on the same uh, team, Dr. Saxena, uh, what is your experience about multiple nodules of FNH? Uh, how often do you see FNH as multiple nodules? Right. So I have seen uh, maybe two or three at the most, but not more than that. I have definitely seen FNH and adenomas, but mm -hmm. multiple, uh, I don't recall ever seeing more than three. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me read you the next question. So morphologically, how do we differentiate NRH from FNH? Okay. Yeah, so NRH by definition is a diffuse process. So if it is focal, you do not call it... Uh, um, if you see something focally, you cannot make it nodular degenerative hyperplasia. It is a diffuse process. It also, by definition, is non-fibrosing. So if you have fibrous septa, then NRH is out of the question. So to me, those would be the two most important things that one is looking for, diffuse or not, and fibrosing or not. All right, uh, thank you again. Uh, let me see what else is there. Yeah. Um, what does the positive CK19 indicate? I was of the impression it was for cholangiocarcinoma. So uh, I don't know, was it, is it probably related to one of the cases that you shared? Yes, this is the, the one with the lung adenocarcinoma. And you're absolutely right. For the longest of time, um, CK19 was being used for cholangiocarcinoma. I loved it because I thought, oh, finally, there's a stain that can tell us about cholangio. 
But uh, the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, you do a little bit of literature search and CK19 is everywhere. Uh, it's especially common in um, salivary gland tumors, for example. It's extremely common. So CK19, I have uh, less um, faith in. I just did it. I don't think that uh, had it come out, you know, it would have helped if the other stains were negative. It might have helped, but uh, in this case, it did not. So it's not specific. I still use it for colangio. You know, it's something that you can sort of hang your hat on a little bit, but we have also started using S100P for colangio. We feel that it is better, but uh, I think, again, it's a newer antibody and I'm, the dirt has not been spilled on that, right? First, when an antibody comes out, we say we think it is God's gift to whatever diagnosis we want, and then the dirt comes out on that. I don't think the dirt has still spilled out on S100P, but on CK19, it is not as specific anymore. But you're right. That was the reason why it was done. So on that note, so what is your experience with uh, albumin is for cholangiocarcinoma? Yeah, so that's a wonderful stain, except that we don't have it. And I didn't have it at Indiana University either. So, but okay. I think that would be a great stain. Okay. Uh, now there is another question. Uh, our colleague says that uh, we have a tough time with differential between hepatic hemangioendothelioma versus hepatic angiosarcoma and other lesions which additional immunostains we can use to support our diagnosis? So uh, to differentiate between the vascular lesions, there is no, as far as I know, there is no immunostain that will differentiate one from the other. But angiosarcomas are extremely malignant. I mean, they scream malignancy as soon as you put the slide underneath. Whereas epithelioid hemangioendothelioma is extremely subtle. It's something that if you are not thinking, if you are a little bit tired and sleepy at 4 p.m. when this biopsy arrives, you might actually miss it. So uh, in my mind, um, in my mind, angiosarcoma doesn't necessarily come into the differential simply because it is so aggressive and it sort of annihilates the liver. Okay, so it's going through the sinusoids and then there are going to be areas where the liver is gone and it's extremely hemorrhagic, by the way. Epithelial demangioendothelioma is fibrosing, angiosarcoma is hemorrhagic. So that would be the difference. Uh, there is a very interesting question, I think. Uh, I can from... see you smiling there. <laughs> Sorry. I can see you smiling, reading that question, so I can see it's interesting, yeah. Yeah, uh, we all hear that uh, there is HCC arising in the setting of cirrhosis. So, there is a what? No cirrhosis, so the carcinoma is metastatic and not primary. Is it true? So I think that's that's the question everybody wants to know. <laughs> say that again. I'm sorry, say that. Please repeat like, that. Uh, if there is cirrhosis and you see a carcinoma, so that means that it is not metastatic. So is it true or not? It's true in about 98 to 99% of cases. However, metastases in the cirrhotic liver have been documented and uh, I have seen two. One I think was a pancreatic, the other one I cannot remember, but I remember seeing two and it's definitely documented. Right, so, so for our viewers, so please don't take it as 100%, so it can happen. Uh, now, there is another question that if the alkaline phosphatase was not elevated and biopsy shows lymphocytic cholangitis, would you still call it PBC? Right. So that's a very interesting question. And it's something that I think about all the time because uh, the largest number of consults that I get are cases of PBC or cases that we should raise the alarm of PBC. Um, so if I had the biopsy that I had without the alphas and it was a middle-aged or a young or a woman, you know, anywhere from whatever, 20 to 80, I would have thought of PBC and I would have raised that uh, alarm even without the alphas because the alphas can go up and down for one thing. The AMA can go up and down. Um, and, uh, Sometimes we are the only people, the pathologists with the biopsy, we are the only people who might actually raise that alarm because the clinician might not, you know, if it's not a hepatologist, if it's a clinician out in uh, the primary care physician, for example, they might not be thinking of it. And you might be the first person who's actually saying, 
think of PVC, do the alphas, do the um, uh, AMA, and if it's negative, repeat it. Ask for uh, undue fatigue. Ask about uh, pruritus, you know, those sort of things. So this is something we have to be, remain very alert to. Right. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Saxena. There is another question from one of our viewers that regarding case number three, uh, the question is not liver related. That's what our viewer says. But you had a very small serous carcinoma in a biopsy and then a total hysterectomy and bilateral selping ophorectomy was done. There was no residual tumor. Is it possible the tumor was totally excised in the previous biopsy? Because I had a similar case where the biopsy was carcinosarcoma and the after surgery, it came with only benign hyperplasia. I'm not sure if I'm being able to read the question properly. No, you're, you're right. It was a thought that went to my head. It was, uh, I didn't say it during the presentation, but it was like taking a sledgehammer to a little ant, you know? Um, so yes, uh, but again, I don't know where you practice. I practice in the United States and, um, you know, there's always, uh, you just cannot leave anything to chance over here. So it was very, very tiny. And yes, they went uh, overboard with it. And that might probably be the reason why they were so alarmed when a three centimeter lesion showed up on the liver, because here they had thought that this is a tiny thing that was all done. So I, 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 I empathize with your question. I agree with your question, but that's what the surgeon decided to do, obviously. And I'm sure that the patient wanted it too, because I'm sure they consulted and the patient was like, I'd rather be safe than sorry. So I can only guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next question is, uh, does CK7 highlight damaged bile ducts? Uh, yes, it does. CK7 okay. will, and sometimes the CK7, if you do it, um, you will not only see the ductular reaction, you will see the loss of bile ducts, you know, by the absence of the bile ducts, but you will actually see the damaged bile ducts because now you'll see a structure that doesn't look like it should, but you know it's a bile duct because it's staining. So yes, it does highlight. Uh, thank you again. And so the next question is about angiomyolipoma. The question is that because hepatic angiomyolipoma can be misdiagnosed as ACC, which additional immunostain or approach we can use to achieve a correct diagnosis? Well, uh, if you have HMB45 positivity, so you can do stains to confirm angiolipoma, angiomyolipoma, which is HMB45, S100. Those are the two main ones. And you can do an arginase one and a HEPAR one for the negative staining, because if it is hepatocellular carcinoma, it would be positive. So those would be the four that uh, you could do to prove one and disprove the other. Right. Um, another question. Um... What is the best immunopanel? That is kind of a broad question. What is the best immunopanel to identify primary site in hepatic metastatic adenocarcinoma? So, yeah. Very difficult. I hate, I hate those, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you start with, uh, what, well, I can tell you what I would do. I would do a CK7, CK20, TTF1 napsin because we have a beautiful double stain, GATA3, uh, CDX2, and maybe a Paxi, maybe. But those would be the six that I would start with and then take it from there. So uh, again, the similar question. So in an unknown primary, if your CK7 is positive, 20 negative, CDX2 weakly positive, and sad B2 negative, so TTF1 negative, and uh, PAX8 negative, what would be the differentials that you give usually on your report and comment? Right, so CK7 positive and CD2 weakly positive, um, then the, and you're saying that the lung is negative. So then we are left with mostly the upper GI tract and the pancreas. And I would probably be doing uh, for the pancreas, one of the stains that we like over here very much is SMAD4 and uh, SPS100P for cholangio. 
Um, and then if it's the upper gastrointestinal tract, like the esophagus or stomach, I think you're just left with uh, not an immuno panel, but telling the clinician, hey, you know, this is a possibility. Right. Now that you mentioned SMAD4, so I just want to add that question to you that what is your experience with SMAD4? Uh, like, does it help? Like, we know that it is in 50% of the cases it is lost. So how do you approach when SMAD4 is retained? Yeah, when it is retained, then, uh, you know, then there's, uh, you're lost. Uh, then we can't really do much. Then we are back to clinical saying that, you know, it could still be pancreas and please rule it out clinically. And how much emphasis do you give to clinical information when you approach a metastatic adenocarcinoma in the liver? See, I think it's a combination. It depends, right? Uh, you do your immunos and if they help you out, so you do your immunos, you look at it and you say, okay, with this panel, this is what I think it is. Then I look at the clinical history or you can look at it ahead of time. I'm not saying necessarily, but then you look at the clinical history and you say, if it matches, fantastic. If it doesn't match, then you go back to the clinician and say, this is what I think it is, you know, please correlate it with your clinical findings. Right. Uh, one last question I see, Dr. Saxena, is CAMTA for specific for epithelial human genitalioma? Um, I don't use it, so actually I cannot comment. I don't want to comment uh, and say something that is misleading. So I'm going to leave that question out for now. Right. And there is a request for transplant pathology. So I think uh, maybe like, I mean, at a later date, we should probably address it uh, at a different session about transplant pathology. Yeah, right. sure. We can do that. I I have cases. I've done transplant for many, many years. So that would be good. It'll help me brush up on my transplant as well. So yeah, we can definitely sure. do that. I think, uh, yeah, because I, I, I mentioned to our viewer also that maybe it would be a good idea to uh, address that question at that time. So I think Dr. Saxena, these are the questions that I saw on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, thank you again for this excellent session and with so many in cases that you have shared with all of us. And uh, our viewers are very appreciative and uh, they have a lot of complimentary uh, comments for you. And you would be happy to know that I think uh, we had a lot of viewers, I think uh, around 200 viewers who joined from different countries, including Ukraine, Pakistan, India, Nicaragua, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Cambodia, Costa Rica, Croatia, uh, to name a few. And thanks to our viewers uh, for always supporting Patcast. And, um, and thanks to Dr. Saxena for this wonderful session and hope we will have more sessions in the future and we will keep you all posted. And just to let you know that our next session, we will move to a topic on GU pathology. There are a lot of changes in GU pathology, as you know, that our speaker is Dr. Andres Matoso, who is an associate professor at uh, Johns Hopkins. And he is going to talk on updates in the renal tumor classification. And that is coming up on October 6th, 12 p.m. Eastern time. So hope to see you at that time. And please don't forget to follow Pathcast on our website, Facebook, YouTube channel, and X. So let us call it X now. And also we have a um, Instagram account. So please follow the Instagram page as well. So thank you so much. And thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Saxena, once again. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this and we will keep this going. Um, yeah, sure. you know, um, and uh, Pathcast and uh, I, I think Pathcast is doing a wonderful job and I learned some placental pathology from Pathcast myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I really think you guys are doing a great job. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.